You're listening to episode 273 of the Fitness Business Podcast. This special episode is brought to you by our podcast partner, Tribe Team Training, the world-class leaders in small group training experiences. Earn unprecedented profit, gain guaranteed results for your members, and ensure the very best small group training education for your coaches. Contact Tribe Team Training today and have a conversation to see just how much opportunity there is at your fitness facility. Go to tribeteamtraining.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Welcome everyone to a very special episode of the show. If you've ever struggled to run a successful and profitable small group training program in your club, or if you've considered introducing small group training but haven't yet launched, then this episode is for you. My special guest this week is the CEO of Tribe Team Training USA, JP Richard. And during our interview, JP and I talk about factors to consider before introducing small group training, best business practices for launch, industry benchmarks, key stakeholders to consider, and JP leaves us with three tips for making small group trading successful and profitable. Let me tell you a little bit more about my special guest. Since launching Tribe Team Training in North America back in 2014, JP has grown the company to help over 80 facilities and over a thousand certified tribe coaches who are changing lives every single day. He prides himself in the fact that all of the tribe member clubs are earning more money and are more profitable than ever by using the tribe system and education platforms and continuing support. We are all set to go for today's interview. So thank you so much for listening in today and enjoy my interview with JP Rashad. JP, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very much, Chantal. It's great to be back. Yeah. We are going to be diving into everything small group training related today and give everyone a little bit of an insight into everything that they need to know when it comes to introducing small group training into their club. So just to... Yeah, so just the, you like this topic, right? It's my favorite topic. <laughs> we've, got the, we've got the right expert on the show for this one. So uh, do you want to start off, just give us a sort of a brief description of a club that best suits introducing small group training. Oh, great, great starting point, because I, I think it's important uh, when considering small group training and, and what clubs could offer that. Uh, really, any fitness business that is looking for ancillary revenue, you know, so any club looking for ancillary revenue should consider a robust small group training department as one of the things they should look at. You know, for example, if you're a standalone studio looking to scale your business from personal training into, you know, a logical next step would be small group training and having a robust system around that is a key way to grow your business. Or on the flip side, if you're a large, you know, full service facility, multi-use facility, having that little boutique area within your club, uh, small group training is a fantastic place uh, to look. So that's, uh, you know, every fitness business in between. So what you're saying is it it doesn't actually matter whether you're big or small. There there are ways that you can actually find the space to introduce small group training. Uh, that's exactly what I'm saying. Any fitness business looking for ancillary revenue, it, it, the difference is really on the goal of the department. You know, for a smaller business, small group training might be a bigger piece of the pie. Whereas a larger group, it might be a little bit smaller piece of the pie. Uh, so it really dials down to what that fitness business is looking for in this department. Okay, so let's run through some of the factors that people should be thinking about. So if I've got a club owner out there that's maybe thinking, you know what, we're about to go into 2020, uh, it's time for me to introduce something new to my members and, and maybe mix things up a little bit. What are, say, three important factors that people should be considering before they introduce small group training into their club? 
Yeah, another great question, Chantal. I, th I think the first one, if you're a club owner or general manager out there, I think the first thing to consider uh, when looking at small group training is to treat this department as a standalone department that sits alongside the rest of your offerings. You know, so if you're a full service facility, uh, you have your personal training department in that silo. Uh, yeah, you have your large group exercise silo, and, and that's fantastic. We believe that, you know, when you launch a small group training department, if you want it to really take off, consider it as a standalone department. And I think that's really important. And I think your listeners will benefit from uh, Sue Richard, your episode 198. I'll plug that one for a second. Great she, episode. <laughs> yeah. But she really defines why having it as a standalone department really affects it. So, so if your listeners go back to listen to 198, that, that really helps there. I think that is a huge sort of important thing. Uh, the second item I would look at is, well, the space, like where are you going to run it, you know, as a standalone department? So how are you going to make it a home and where are you going to make it a home? And that's an interesting one because that's different everywhere, <laughs> you know, by creating a home. And then the third thing I would consider is just think through the process. How are you going to systemize this? How is this department going to be integrated to your sort of everyday operation? So how is your staff going to sell it? How is your marketing department going to market this department? How are your coaches going to deliver the product to your members? All these sort of things are, are very important to consider when thinking about doing small group training in your club. So JP, I just want to go back to that, that middle one that you mentioned, which is the where, and you talked about creating a home for it, because I know that one of the, you know, potential challenges or maybe roadblocks that different club managers have mentioned before is the fact that, oh, you know, we've got equipment in, in this space, you know, how are we actually going to find space? How do we find a home? Are there any examples that you can share with us where you've been able to work with a club owner and, you know, look at the space that they've had and identify where they can bring or introduce small group training into? Yeah, that's such a big topic that you just brought up, Chantal. We could have a whole podcast just on this because <laughs> I think the way the industry is going, at least in the United States and Canada, where, where I work, uh, it, you know, clubs are already creating functional areas in a lot of places. And there's a lot of great companies out there that do good work in this space. Um, it, you know, so functional area obviously is a, is a, a place to consider. Now, it's no secret. I run tribe team training here in North America and we work with, you know, quite a few clubs here that have different sort of areas where they run our programs. And what's intriguing to us is our successful clubs, our most successful clubs, there's no key different. Like there's, it could be a standalone studio or an old sort of racquetball, converted racquetball court. We've had successful clubs run on the open floor. We've had very successful clubs run it on half a basketball court. Space in itself is important. It's important to make it a home for your members. So your members understand, oh, this is where that happens. Yet I think it's really around the behavior of your staff and that experience your members are getting become even more important than, than the actual space. But you do need to make it a home. And, and another interesting fact on that is, of, of course, I tour the, uh, Canada and the, I talk to club owners and, and in the United States especially. And a lot of times too, they don't even know the space that they have. Of course, they know their businesses. That's not what I mean. They don't know their own floor. But they, I think it comes into they can't see the forest from the tree scenario because the depending on the size of the department that they're looking for, oftentimes they can't even consider how to repurpose sort of areas to run a, a, a robust small group training department. Uh, so home, again, it's, it's important to have could look very, very different in very different places. And it's in direct conjunction to how big you want this department to be for your business. JP, I want to talk about how we can make sure that we set ourselves up for success before launching small group training and clubs. So what I'd like to take a look at is if we say looked at the, let's say four to six weeks prior to yeah. launching small group training in our club, Talk us through any actions or any steps you've seen clubs make that has ensured that it's been a really successful launch for them. 
Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the first thing that any club looking to do, whether you're big or small club, is you need to identify your vision. What does this department mean to you as a business? So is it, you know, whether you're thinking uh, in terms of participation numbers, revenue numbers, how many sessions in a week that you're going to be delivering, but you need to clearly articulate what this vision is. So identifying what that department actually, the goal of that department is, uh, is hugely important. And then by going at it together. I think everybody has to be on the same page, you know, creating a, because launching a new department or revamping a department, if you already are offering small group training and maybe you want to jazz it up or change it up, I think that you need a lot of people involved uh, to create, you know, from your frontline staff, do they know you know, how to sell it, what to say about the different programs or different sort of uh, offerings that you're going to deliver in small group training. Does your salespeople, uh, is it part of your onboarding process or isn't? Is it part of your sales funnel or isn't? Uh, All these sort of questions, how are you going to pay your coaches? What coaches are you going to use? All these sort of things should be addressed prior to launching. And and this is some of the things that we definitely work on in the uh, launch process with our clubs at Tribe. But I think any club out there, these are the fundamental pieces. So really working through your process and and getting it into your your sales funnel and getting it into your marketing campaigns all need to be fundamentally important. And then practice. I think think the last thing I'd do is once you identified that, um, start practicing. (laughs) You know, do they know how to say, you know, the common questions. Do you have FAQs, you know, frequently asked questions and your staff, are they, do they understand it and and could uh, answer these types of questions? You know, I've I've got to just put my support behind um, what you're saying in relation to making sure that you're all on the same page, that every single team member knows exactly what that small group training program looks like, you know, what to expect. And as you suggested, like train them up, get them to do the program, get them to be part of it so that when someone walks in and speaks to the welcome desk person, and says, "Hey, what's this? What's this new small group training program that you've that you've introduced?" That welcome desk person can say, "Yeah, it's awesome. I actually was doing it the other week, and this is what's involved, and this is what to expect." You know, so so making sure that your entire team, like anything new that we introduce to our business, but that your entire team is immersed in the program, in the product before you actually launch. I can see why that is so important, and so. JP, if we then kind of flipped that and, you know, rather than looking what the success factors are, is there anything that you would say we should avoid doing or or any kind of hurdles that we need to steer clear of before launching small group training? Well, there's a couple of things I could think of that that I've seen out there with clubs. And and I think the first one is, is they just didn't integrate this new product into their sales funnel. You know, oftentimes on their onboarding process for new members. And I think that's, that's a huge sort of mistake clubs are making because if, cl- if members don't even know it exists, there's no way they're going to get in there. And I think part of the reason why is oftentimes you go into clubs and even, even today, uh, you walk into a club and they're selling personal training. Uh, and then, the cl- you know, if the member doesn't buy that, they're off, they go into group exercise or run on your treadmills. And, and what's interesting is while launching small group training or, or tribe team training into clubs is we found that not one of our clubs has any change in personal training numbers. In fact, with clubs that do have tribe, their personal training numbers actually slightly increase uh, because members get used to paying for services and things like that. So it's very interesting to see. So I think integrating it in the sales funnel, and don't be scared, you're not going to lose out on personal training for your GMs and your operations guys out there, because it's pretty amazing to see because now you're introducing people to a whole new concept and service that members get to, you know, participate in a couple times a week or whatever that, you know, when they do want to make that jump, they do go up into PT. But I think the number one thing is, well, clubs who, who don't sell it initially, I think they, they lose out on a massive, massive opportunity. Great advice. Thank you for, for diving into that. So we had a look at the success factors and what to avoid in, in that launch period in the four to six weeks prior to launching. So let's have a look at the actual launch itself. Do you want to run us through any best business practices that we should adhere to during the actual launch? 
Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things in there that uh, that I've already discussed. One is identify what success is. Like any project out there, I think having the end in mind when jumping on a project, whether it's launching small group training or anything in, in business or in life, uh, is having the end in mind. So having a clear vision of what success is, is hugely important. Then identifying who's in charge of what. Uh, and, and how and who's responsible for all these things. Um, and, and then working through sort of a marketing timeline over a, a period of time. In our experience, you know, uh, it's, it's, you know, eight to 12 weeks is really the best sort of time frame to launch a new department uh, in a facility. So we work with clubs approximately that time, sometimes a little bit longer, sometimes a little bit less. But ideally, you want to work through eight to 12 weeks. And, and during that time frame is everybody uh, gets identified with their key roles because, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, every action has a reaction and it has consequences and unintended consequences. So working through the process and integrating the sales funnel, integrating your marketing funnel, integrating your recruiting uh, ideas and things like that uh, and actual programs, like what programs are you going to deliver to your members? Are your coaches prepared to deliver these types of programs and, and these sort of things? So working through all that over the course of that timeline uh, gives you the best chance of, uh, of success. Excellent. You know, with time, we, we provide a lot of that for our clubs and make it unique to their specific goals. But uh, there's nothing more important than identifying what success is. Yeah, that makes complete sense and really good that you put that um, that time frame on at the 8 to 12 weeks of that launch period. So what I'd like to step into next, JP, is numbers. Let's have a look at some metrics around small group training. Do you want to give us an idea of what a successful small group training launch looks like from a numbers perspective? Maybe Maybe share with us some industry benchmarks and maybe give us an idea of how long we can expect it might be until they, you know, they really reach those, those numbers. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, numbers are hugely important. And, uh, but it's one of those questions that you ask there that is different for everybody. Uh, numbers are specific numbers. And I don't like to give specific numbers because uh, a studio in New York City is charging very, very different than a massive club in a small town with only 5,000 residents. You know, so understanding your marketplace is really important and understanding success to you might be different success for somebody else. So I do believe that you, not, you must look at it inside your own business and, and identifying what success is there. Now, that being said, so, you know, clubs out anywhere in any sort of rural area don't compare to what uh, numbers are doing in big major cities. But that being said, I, I believe that, you know, if you're looking at a, you know, there's generic stats out there, like 45% of people of your members into group exercise, therefore you have a very successful group X department. Uh, if you're doing five to 10% of your members into personal training, therefore you're running a pretty good uh, uh, personal training department. Well, my belief in small group training is whatever you're doing in personal training, that should be in, in terms of penetration. So if you're running a 5% uh, penetration rate in your in your personal training that should be a benchmark to start with small group training you know so so when you when you think about it if a club a fitness business that sells uh, personal training for sixty dollars an hour uh, and you sell it to maybe a hundred people that's great uh, so your business is good at selling an hour for a hundred dollars an hour why can't that business sell at least that many for something of a fraction of the price if the product is there and the service is there, there's no reason why fitness business can't sell at least that many. Um, so I guess my answer in numbers uh, to you specifically is uh, whatever you're doing in personal training, that's a starting point for small group training. That's a great benchmark. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it makes complete sense what you're saying about, you know, club in New York City is going to be quite different to a, to a big box facility and uh, and I'm sure that changes geographically as well. So I think those percentages and that um, personal training to small group training reference that you make gives us a great sort of foundation of, uh, of what we can look to strive for. So now we've had a, had a chat in the lead up to this and you were saying to me that there are three key stakeholders when it comes to having a, a successful small group training program. So do you want to talk us through who those 
key stakeholders are and what it is that we should know about them to ensure that we are successful. Sure, yeah. So three key stakeholders of any fitness business are the members, your staff, and ownership. I think those are the stakeholders in any fitness business. Mm -hmm. And sort of how small group training relates to that is when you think about the member's perspective uh, and creating sort of that small group experience for your members is what do they see? You know, and, and what's what's great about small group training and, and you know, people are adding, uh, spending, you know, additional money, it's ancillary revenue, uh, but you always have to think about it through their eyes and saying, why am I spending? You know, your members are thinking, why am I spending money? And so the, the experience that you create for your members uh, is all the soft touches in between the sessions and between the push-ups. So what sort of service are they getting between sessions? The little bit of rolling out the red carpet for them when they arrive for the sessions. What, what environments that they're actually going in? You know, so the actual programs that you're putting out there, are they, you know, in an environment that they enjoy being in? So one members and through their eyes is, is certainly one stakeholder. Secondly is the coaches. I think the, the people, your staff delivering the programs, are they, uh, well, first of all, are they qualified? Have they ever had education in small group training? Like I love, you know, you could go out there and find world-class education to be the, the smartest personal trainer out there and create the best program for any type of member, uh, any type of body style, any type of, you know, uh, a person that needs help in personal training. So you could go out there and get world-class education uh, on that. You could go on the flip side in group exercise. There's tons of information out there to get world-class education on group X. And, and conversely, so your coaches, when you're looking at your coaches to deliver, have they had any sort of education around small group training? Uh, and not necessarily the push-up stuff, but really around behavior, mm. you know, Humans are social animals, and a lot of the younger people in there, they, they are really, other than physical, uh, you know, they're looking for results and value like all of our other members, but they're really looking for social connection. So how are your coaches trained on creating that? Because small group training and, and, and what we like to call team training is really, really important on creating that social connection, creating those environments. Uh, so are your staff educated on delivering that type of sort of, you know, the environment that your members want. And then of course is the ownership. So, you know, creating a system where all the cylinders. So when you create, it goes back to what I was saying earlier around creating the process, uh, understanding the vision and the business metrics around it. So understanding how to pay your coaches, understanding what to charge for the programs, allocating your marketing resources. So your marketing campaigns are online and, and they have sort of that profit line or, or that revenue stream and setting the goals and the standards for their staff to execute on uh, has to be a win-win-win all the way through. Um, and so that's what we talk about when we talk about the three key stakeholders. JP, great advice there. And you know what, throughout this conversation, you've given us so many great insights into how to ensure that we have a successful lead up to the launch, a successful launch in itself. So let's kind of wrap all of this up. And this is, I feel like this is a tough question because you've already given us so much, but if you had to say your three main tips for making small group training successful and profitable in our club, what would those three things be? Okay. Yes. Uh, Again, identifying, have a clear vision or clear goal, a clear sort of everybody understands what success is in your business. The number one thing to do, throwing, you know, numbers at a wall and seeing what sticks isn't a best business approach. I think like anything, it's important to have a goal, uh, a realistic goal, and it's important that everybody understands what that goal is for that small group training department. So if you're, again, going back to what I was saying earlier, if your goal is to, to have, you have 5% penetration rate in personal training and 5% and penetration rate for small group is your goal, great, let's identify it. Treating your small group training, the second thing is treating your small group training as a standalone department. Mm. 
All too often I, in tribe team training, our most successful clubs treated as a, as a standalone department. The clubs that maybe aren't getting the numbers that they want is, I, I believe, is just simply because it's, well, it's underneath another department or uh, the leader of the department maybe, you know, isn't really a manager or, you know, they're not treating it as such. So every, it just gets a derivative. So I very much encourage clubs to create this as a standalone department uh, with its own unique goals and then get educated. Uh, so staff, uh, like I was saying earlier, with uh, coaches on delivering programs to, to members, to uh, your front house and your operational procedures and your sales and marketing people to support it. I think staff education on the processes uh, and being managed that they're doing what they need to do is hugely important. I, I think if you uh, have a clear vision, you're treating it as a standalone department and getting everybody educated on what's important and managing that you're going to run a successful small group training department. JP, for all of the FBP family who have listened to our conversation today and are feeling inspired to explore introducing small group training into their club in 2020, how do they get in touch with you to have a chat and, uh, and just see what their options are? Yeah, so any club around the world looking to do small group training could easily look at our, our website at tribeteamtraining.com. You know, I visit hundreds of clubs every year and I study this stuff. I study how small group training works in, con in conjunction to all the other offerings and all I do. And sometimes to be absolutely fair, it, it might not be right for you at this point or, or this club at this point in time to really make a kick, a, a kick at the can. But I implore you, yeah, just email me JP at Tribe Team Training or look at our website at tribeteamtraining.com um, and we'll get in touch with you. Yeah. Excellent. And I want to just leave today's interview by reminding everyone that if you are listening at the moment and you're thinking, oh, you know, I feel like I just don't have the space. My studio isn't set up for small group training. I actually think that in many cases you might be surprised. And if you open up the idea of chatting to JP or chatting to one of the team from Tribe, then really tap into their expertise because chances are at some stage in some country around the world, they have gone into a studio just like yours and they've been able to take a look at the space that's available and work out a way that small group training can actually fit into that space. So I guess my, my advice to all of you right now is think about, you know, what does 2020 look like in your business? You know, what are you introducing to your members to keep things exciting and, and you know, keep your members engaged? Because maybe this is the year that you should be looking at introducing small group training. A huge thank you to JP for such a detailed and informative interview today. And a reminder that Tribe Team Training is a proven turnkey standalone profit center for your fitness business. You can earn unprecedented financial results and you can find out more about Tribe Team Training. Just simply go to tribeteamtraining.com or click on the link in today's show notes at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. I want to say a big thank you also to our foundation partner, Active Management. Are you a fitness business owner, manager, or entrepreneur who wants to think and do different to your competitors? Go to activemgmt.com.au to find out how. Thank you once again for joining me for this special episode of the Fitness Business Podcast. Please make sure you tune in next week for my interview with Robert Jackson from Fitness BI. Until then, remember... What you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into lives of others. Mm -hmm.